Welcome to part two. We're talking about the brand new BRZ. We've already done the GR86. So if you want details on that, check it out because they are almost identical in most ways. With the exception of individual personalization for the brands, the exterior, the front and the rear is different. However, aerodynamically, they are both equally impressive compared to anything else in their price point. And really, this is one of the cheapest performance cars or cheapest sports cars on the planet that is driver centric. So when you get on the inside compared to the GR86, this is the cheaper trim level, which they call premium here, and Toyota calls their upper trim level premium. So you get the premium, which is the cheap one, and the limited on the Subaru. So what does that mean? Well, look at the doors. You have this fabric that looks like it's out of my grandpa's lawn chair. You have pleather on the door cards instead of Alcantara. The seats are all fabric, although they breathe way better than the Alcantara seats and they feel super grippy. They're gonna be great in the winter, but they, <laughs> you're not gonna be impressed by the way they look, but it's one of the most functional, most purposeful interior layouts for driving in existence. There is zero bullshit in here, and I'm not kidding you. Everything is set up so you're not distracted from the road and the enjoyment factor. There are some things that I don't like. And I said this on the 86 video, there's some Lexusness to this, like the RC, the dashboard upper part is very reminiscent of that. And they've carried over these horrible digital turn signals. They have no detent, they don't click in a place. So I'm constantly hitting it and then I, I, you know, I forget that I clicked it all the way and then you gotta click it back. It's just the stupidest thing. The only thing I can think that they put it here for is for tuners that wanna use this as some type of map selector switch. I don't know. Everything else feels and looks good. The dual zone climate controls, all those buttons are simple. The shifter, although this is an automatic, it still has a, a great clicky mechanical feel to it. You have a manual parking brake here still. The sport and drive mode selectors are basic. It, it, everything is as simple as you can possibly get, including the gauge cluster. Everything is super readable. The infotainment is very basic. It's way better than the last gen, easy to use. However, you still can't defeat the fake engine noise here. You have to go to the dealership or tune it out or code it out. And the audio system, or at least the base audio system in here is not good. And I know you're not expecting great things, but it really tests poorly and it doesn't sound the best. The, the only thing you can do is turn off all of the EQ effects, all the special equalizer effects and get it neutralized. That sounds way better that way. In the glove box, there's some special switch here for you. So you can change between your summer and winter tire modes for pressures. And that might be helpful if you're switching from track tires or wheels as well. Everything else is the same as the GR86, so I'm not gonna run it into the ground because there's some technical differences between the cars that we're gonna cover now. It's about time. Back under uh, the Subaru BRZ, there's some differences from the BRZ to the GR86. Not completely apparent on the surface, aside from two things, which we'll point out. But tell me, what is Subaru's game plan here? The BRZ has a younger buying demographic than the GR86, despite originally being more money. And in this car's case, more people use the BRZ as a single family vehicle, or it's their only car is basically what I'm getting at, versus the GR86. So when Subaru was designing this car, they prioritized making it a better daily driver, a better all-around car, where they decreased NVH, made it a little bit more livable inside the cabin. They also did their best to make this a little bit more approachable. And that was the design philosophy and tuning philosophy behind this car. So essentially it has higher speed stability, meaning it's less prone to oversteer, and they baked in more safety features from the in this car from the get-go. They've also gone as far as, and this is universal of this vehicle, the GR86 is the same way, Due to their design improvements, they also lowered the center of gravity by doing some subtle things like moving the seats closer together, lowering the hood, or sorry, the roof of this car, and the way they mount the motor as well. The car, the whole CG of this vehicle is reduced by four millimeters, which isn't a lot, but it is something. Yeah, one could something. argue, what yeah. is that gonna do? All I could lower the center of gravity by packing on about 250 pounds too, <laughs> so, I mean, I, okay, it's it's all really what this is. It's about making subtle improvements to the body, and some of it's probably packaging that just happened to make those improvements for them. Um, but what else do we have, Jack? So in the front, and this is the big thing when you're looking at these cars right away, you're going to notice this car has an aluminum set of front knuckles where the, uh, the Toyota has steel. 
and it is actually more noticeable than we originally thought. Well, it's not a big piece, and that's why I was saying the GR86. If you're somebody that buys a Toyota product, you could literally buy this and just swap the knuckle out. You know, it's easy to do, and again, this is to reduce unsprung mass. Yes. It's a little bit lighter. It's supposed to be stronger, maybe, arguably, who knows. Uh, I mean, it's such a small piece. And, and then, then in the front, you also have a different style front sway bar. Mm. So in the GR86, you have an 18 millimeter solid front sway bar, where in this car, you have an 18.3 hollow front sway bar. 18.6? Don't cheat me on inches. It is 18.3 millimeters. Oh my God, this guy is a genius. Yes. See, it, it, I'm it, always it, trying to pack on a couple extra inches. <laughs> you're trying to take them away from me. But okay, so what does that do? So because you have a larger front sway bar, you have theoretically less front mechanical grip. It'll in introduce a little bit more understeer. And they've also reduced the size of the solid rear sway bar. And obviously the, the mounting location is also different from 15 millimeters to 14 millimeters. Mm. And now it is body mounted versus a rear subframe mount. Well, I we could argue that because when you look at the two bars, they, so the subframe is different because there's a welded on bracket for the sway bar on the GR86. This does not have that welded on bracket. It has a completely separate piece to mount. The sway bar mount is forward facing. Mm -hmm. The 86 is rearward facing. And then you have a brace that's here on this one that you don't get on the 86. And Subaru claims that they did it, mounted it this way because that's how they do it on their other cars with the Subaru, Subaru Global Platform. That's how they do it going forward, so they just carried it over here. Like we saw in our Forrester video. Yes, although this is not on the Subaru Global Platform. They took bits and pieces of it from the improvements that they got from all of that to here. Oh, so you have different damper tuning, and they did not get into specifics, but they did talk about spring rates. The front spring rate in the BRZ is higher, and the rear spring rate is lower. And 10 to 1, every single year this is going to change again and again because they're constantly retuning. They might even get a different supplier where the spring rates change on them. So the, these are small, minute numbers that are going to be not noticeable to anybody unless you're doing back-to-back -back lapping where you're timing it. On, you know, in similar days, a similar weather, and on top of that as well, they have even more minor changes to EPS tuning for the BRZ versus the 86, and supposedly... They have different engine tuning, and we dyno this car, and I will acknowledge it's not apples to apples. It's not the same day. This is an automatic. But it is the same temperature and almost the same humidity yes. running the same Shell 93 octane gas with minimal ethanol content. And we got complaints on the 86 that we faked it. They did the dyno wrong. The dyno's broken. And this was at King Motorsports. Again. Who does tuning <laughs> cars all the time, and they've been tuning for 57 years. They've been around, and just because it's not in California doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah, this made the identical torque, <laughs> uh, which is impressive for an automatic, automatic and yes. it made, after some of the heat soak set in, like we did for the manual car, and made 204 horsepower at the wheels. And 209 horsepower peak, which is identical to what the 86 made with a manual transmission, but the horsepower dropped off more dramatically. When I say dramatically, it dropped off two. Yeah, it, was like, yeah. it dropped off two extra horsepower from the manual transmission. So there's not a ton of drivetrain loss. And based on this dyno, you would assume that they are underrating the power numbers for this car, unless we have ringers. Yeah. Don't know. Wait till the production cars get dyno. Which I am buying one. I am buying a manual GR86 in 15 anyway. years, one production <laughs> show. <laughs> Hey, we'll production. dyno that car again, and people will say it's fake. Is there anything else, Jack, here that's very important? Other than the fact that we have the wrong gearbox, Mark. It is an Azen gearbox, six-speed. They've improved the torque converter and the clutch backs for the torque converter and retuned it for this generation, so it's not a carryover completely. It's supposed to shift faster. It's supposed to be more responsive. <laughs> and Jack's going to tear me a new one about it in the drive, so let's get out there. Jack, the automatic BRZ, it's everybody's dream. Oh boy, I can't wait. <laughs> Let's see how this gets off the line. Really not bad. This, even in automatic form, is instantaneously way quicker than the old car. And I know that's gonna be the overwhelming sentiment. 
I mean, it, it now does 60 in the low to mid sixes, which is much faster than the prior generation vehicle, which I believe was like in the mid to high sevens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, th this just, it, it really, it's quick. And it's deceivingly fast because it's way smoother too. The way that it builds power, the engine builds power where you don't feel like a huge dip and then it pulls at the high end without feeling like wheezy. Yeah, we've driven this car now, Mark, on the track twice, mm -hmm. both both GR86s, but at the original Monticello event, and then at Autobahn Country Club where we compared it to some other vehicles, we've never really spent time with this car on the street. So that's what I want to focus on in this BRZ, and besides, as we talked about in the shop segment, they really tune the BRZ to be a little bit more forgiving, easier to drive at the limit. So. Let's talk about it. What All do you right. think? I think we need to talk about the transmission first. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so to it's me, trash. It, it is. It's total trash. It's not trash. You drive. All right. So we argued a long time off camera about this car. So 70% of these vehicles are sold as automatics, which means 70% of the owners, unless they have a physical disability, this car is a thousand times better as a manual. This gearbox feels about a decade old, which, oh, Jack, it's reliable. It's never going to break. <laughs> I don't care. If you want reliable, get a Corolla or a Camry. You're buying a rear-wheel drive sports car with a limited slip differential, and it'll go sideways, and it looks cool. I want more than reliable. I want a gearbox that responds. <laughs> I want it to downshift when I want it to. And there are other cars in this price segment, but yes, they're front wheel drive. Okay, tell me, what, tell me what gearboxes are better. Veloster N. We both admit it's better in that car. The Veloster N is better as a DCT, and it's a good gearbox. Okay, let me counterpoint you there. The dual clutch and all the Hyundais and Kias were blowing up for six years until they got it right. It was absolute but, trash. Hey, so you now said they, they got, got one. They, they, they got, got right. one that we don't even know. It's brand new. So you, okay, right. rule that G one out. GLI. The car G and the GTI. It's front wheel drive, and it's not that responsive. It's, it's better it's, than it's, this. It is better than this, <laughs> but it's it's not like oh my god, I have to have it. it it's not life changing, but it is still better than like the sundial cell gearbox you have in this oh, car, which okay. takes so forever. What's the direct competitor to this? The Miata transmission, the automatic. I will also I'll raise you Mustang EcoBoost. Okay. Uh, that's a better transmission. 10-speed automatic. It is better. It is similarly priced. It, I'm not saying it's a better car, but automatic to automatic, this feels old. Okay. I, the only other one is the Miata, and I think yes. the Miata automatic is very comparable to this car. It's certainly not... I think the automatic and the Miata is a little bit smoother. It's smoother to downshift, but... They're very similar. They're very, si they're very, very similar. If you're looking at this purely against the Miata, right? Which is, uh, to be honest, if you're buying this as a sports car and this is what you want as your daily driver, that's what you're going to cross shop as right. against. Well, let, hold on a second. Let me get, let me launch this before we get pulled over. <laughs> to me is the biggest annoyance of this. It is reluctant to downshift into second gear and absolutely will not downshift into first gear unless you're really at a low RPM. That is where this cripples the fun of the car and we noticed it on track. However, I will tell you this, it's nowhere near as bad as you make it out to be because one thing is I'm coming from a, a place of perspective of coming from sportier cars that had automatic transmissions from the late 90s, early 2000s that were so bad that everybody had to have a manual transmission. True. This okay. is not like that. It's not like that at all. It, you can you can have a ton of fun with it. It's still quick to respond. It reminds me a lot of the eight-speed automatic and the Lexus F Sport products. Okay. Like that that's kind of the shift quality. It's it's consistent. The only problem is it's not super fast like a dual clutch, and it doesn't want to downshift as eagerly. It's still smooth in regular driving. It does everything you ask it to do. My counterpoint is this is no longer the late 90s, early 2000s. <laughs> okay, is... so what do you, you want a Porsche PDK No, in a I don't want a Porsche PDK. I want something that is equivalent to cars that this is being cross-shopped against. I know plenty of people who've bought Civic SIs, GTIs, Yeah, so you GLIs. want a CVT, you yeah. want the Subaru <laughs> CVT, or you want the Honda CVT, because that's the other alternative here. I think it's totally fine, and people are going to enjoy it, and it's proven, and it's reliable, and I'm right. <laughs> okay, but you, you, you make a great point. 
I, I will give you that. It's not the, it, it could be better. All right, so let, let's get back to the dynamics before you this eject me out car. of this car. It's a yes. softer car. When you brake, you feel more dive. When you turn in, there's more understeer initially, <laughs> but it still will go from under to oversteer yes. like the GR86. It's just a little bit slower to do that. And I think from my driving, what I've noticed, it's more comfortable. It's more compliant than the last car. You could drive this every day on the street and it does not beat you up. There's not this over-reliance on rebound to make it feel sporty in the dampers. It's a perfect setup for a street car. The problem is, is if you start driving it harder, it is soft, and there is a disconnect between the front and the rear end, and I noticed it more in the wet. You feel nothing in the back end. You feel no transition, and the steering now, to me, feels a little bit more numb and it could be the tires it could be that softness in the we're tires. on the premises we're on like the we're in the poverty the eco, spec. yeah, yeah, yeah the beer the, we're in the the cheapest variant of the brz which is the smaller uh smaller wheels same size tires but they are less sticky and i think though if you're just coming from the prior generation vehicle the last car was not the best long distance gt car it was no. very noisy no. didn't ride that great this fixes most of those problems. This is way better yes. in every regard as a street car from the old 86 mm -hmm. and BRZ. It just hands down, there's no, no argument about that. The sacrifice is it's softer, it's a little bit more vague, the front to the rear feels more disconnected because it's soft, and my other complaint is braking. And I've noticed this on the 86 and the BRZ, you have to get a lot of a lot of pedal pressure to get this thing to stop, and I feel like there's a high level of pad compressibility, which I haven't noticed on a lot of cars, and I don't know if it's the pad compound, but there's the initial buildup of hydraulic force, and then that last bit, there's this squishiness before you get bite, and I don't like that. I feel like it could have a harder pad. It could have a more instantaneous bite. I'm not talking about yeah. on and off switch, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit on the slower side. Do you or think you could side. fix that with an aftermarket yes. set of pads? Most everything we're complaining about is going to be fixed. Nobody's buying this really and going to keep it stock. All of it can be corrected. And we talked about a lot of the changes in the shop jack, and we're just kind of beating a dead horse at this point. Well, Mark, I think with that, then it's time for us to get into the final thoughts. Yes, please. Get out. <laughs> Final thoughts on the new BRZ, much like the GR86. Everything that was good there is good here. There's minimal differences aside from aesthetics. There are some mechanical differences with suspension like the last car and typical Subaru fashion. They want this to feel a little bit more safe, which means a little bit more understeer. And when I say understeer, we're talking about like five to 10%. It's so minimal, you're not gonna notice it on street driving. Speaking of which, we put this on the street and it is amazing. It rides softer than the old car, it is more compliant, and it is way quieter, which means you can drive this every single day and not feel like you want to drop it off and get into something else. The interior storage is excellent. The door panels hold a bottle. You have s space in the center stack to put things. It's not a completely compromised car. When you think sports car, you think, okay, there's no place to put anything like a Miata or even some of these weird coupe SUVs that we're seeing. This is more practical in many ways than those. Now, yes, it's a two-door car, so your back passengers are gonna be suffering a bit, but the trunk is amazing. You can still fit a ton of things in there. That's what I love about this car. Price, usability, and now there's more refinement, and it still maintains that fun-to-drive character. The fake engine noise, I'd be curious to see what it sounds like without that, but you know it's way quicker. The manual transmission is one of the best in the price segment, and the automatic transmission, despite what Jack says, is really not all that bad. Could it be better? Yes, but what do you expect here? There's nothing else like this anymore, so I'm not gonna complain. It's up to you to get behind the wheel of this thing and make your own decision if you wanna slap down 30 plus thousand dollars and probably a dealer markup. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.